because yeah, I, clearly you think of it a different way than I was thinking about it, which is which is beautiful because I like that you have a different opinion on it than I do because I saw it as like the same way like my own my, our own prime minister here gets angry at pro he says he said the protesters protesting is okay as long as you're not protesting the government which is such an absurd thing for that was him defending the way he treated the truckers in Ottawa right he's going like I'm mm -hmm. okay with you protesting anything but you can't protest government policy that's not right and it's going like if you're not protesting government policy what are you protesting so in my mind I'm thinking like like he's trying to say that like and I thought in my mind he was saying that you know um, we must worry about how secure our government is before we can actually worry about creativity, you know, which, you know, which I thought was like some sort of roundabout way to bring, to bring in a hot button topic that had nothing to do with what we were talking about. Um, so like I'm in my mind, I'm thinking like, does that mean like slaves, like the black slaves that invented the blues in the plantation fields in the Southern U S shouldn't be allowed to make music because, you know, they weren't part of a democracy. You know, that was not a secure democracy for the slaves mm -hmm. that wrote that beautiful music, right? Mm -hmm. Or or like, and, and in my experience, the the most elaborate and beautiful creativity comes out of oppression, not through a, a secure democracy. People who make a good music in most cases, and if I've experienced, or good art, are, are tormented by something deep that is is destroying them in a, in, a, in a very heavy way. And the art is their way of coping with it through a cathartic expression, you know? Yeah. Now that's my experience with music. And that's what, like a lot of the musicians I listen to, you hear it in their music, right? Like when you listen to, when you listen to Nirvana, you know, one of the biggest bands in my childhood, you know, Kurt Cobain wasn't a happy person. He wasn't, he wasn't all, you know, he wasn't singing about sunshine and peace and happiness. Mm. He was singing about how much it hurts to be alive and he wishes he was dead. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was, you know, so his suicide or whatever happened to him, this shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. Just like a lot of those people, not to, not to say people should be worried about people that make sad music. It's just, you know, sad people tend to be more creative for whatever reason. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, well, I think it's the, maybe, it's maybe the disparity between the aspirations that creativity brings you know that you that you you express yourself Kurt Cobain's probably a good example you express yourself in this wonderful way and you get lots of adulation but at the end of the day it's not enough you know that you thought that maybe that would be enough that would change everything when you when you changed you didn't change the world you changed your world by bringing this music into the world and you know you have all these screaming fans and all of that kind of stuff but you still like to play with guns you still like to dice with death, you know, and that's like what happened to him at the end. And it's, uh, you know, maybe that's what that message is, that it's it's not so much about that miserable people, <laughs> miserable people make good music. It's that miserable people who make good music are still miserable at the end of it, you know, because you can think of, there's, there's plenty of people who make great music. The Beatles, I think, were all weren't miserable people they were all they were all re seemed reasonably happy although they dealt with all the normal pressures of life you know um yeah there's plenty of, there's plenty of examples you could give of of people with all different kinds of psychologists who make all different kinds of music it doesn't really i don't think it's a linear equation between you know uh, op oppression in fact i mean i'm thinking I'm, I'm trying to think about music from oppressed regimes and I can't think of I, it's not coming to my mind there's nothing that comes to my mind and says oh yeah that music that came out of that oppressive regime was really good or that I can't think of any because you, they probably if if the music's not politically correct they probably don't get to make it you know what I mean well yeah inside, inside of the regime angle like I see what you're saying the, the way I'm thinking about it is like like a like I equated blues to slavery you know, the oh, same well, way, that like, would be one. You know, yeah, that would be one. Yes, of course. Aye, aye. But also, know, also, I was thinking, like, also then, jazz as well. Jazz, if you if you if you take that as exactly. the as the root of it, then jazz comes out of that as well. Out of that, you know, disenfranchised people. And not the and not the and maybe black people are are are, are sort of the key in this. Not to sound like I hate to like put racial divisions in it, but you know, the idea of rhythm and complex rhythms comes almost completely out of Africa. It seems like right, which is. Not, I mean, Africa is full of oppression and all sorts of darkness when it comes to you know, the way people have treated each other there, right? And then I think about hip hop too. Like I'm not a big fan of hip hop, but hip hop has clearly been the driving force in popular music for the last 30 years, and that comes out of out of the ghetto and the poor parts, right? And and it and I think like David Byrne made a good point one time in a TED talk about like the origins of music being a direct reflection of the place they're being made. Right. So hip hop, I think, is an example of the poverty, right? Because you don't need anything but a microphone. You, don't even, you just need a voice. All you have to do is be able to talk and you can make hip hop. Right. You don't need a guitar. You don't need a microphone. You don't need speakers. 
right? And I think this the same reason why basketball is probably a big sport for for impoverished neighborhoods because all you need is a ball. You don't need you don't need organization. You don't need cleats and protected pads and and a membership to some club. You know, you just show <laughs> up and you throw the ball around, right? As long as the ball's got air in it, you can play basketball, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, so I think that a lot of that. Um, at least in North America, I think a lot of that's kind of still stems out of, you know, what we perceive as, as like the lower common denominator or the, the struggling, you know, class. Cause I know originally music came from the rich, right? Like you had to be able to afford a piano to be able to write music and who could afford a piano 500 years ago. Exactly. Only people that were either, yeah. yeah, people who were gift, gifted a piano by someone rich or they were rich already, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, so it's, it's hard. I don't know. I'm, it's hard to say. And then in, you look at Russia nowadays, like nothing comes out of Russia that seems to be, worthwhile or china you know and they seem like they're very heavily repressed but that could be like i said the state stopping it because it's not politically correct the only thing i could think about from russia that has any sort of political or popular clout would be uh, was it pussy riot they were called or something like that oh a yeah punk yeah, rock yeah. band of you know but like that's not real music in my mind that's more of a political statement like i've never listened to pussy riot thought that's a good song now, now that i come to think of it I, I would guess the punk movement was was um was the the voice of a disaffected youth Although quite a lot of the people who were involved in it were not youths as such, they were a bit older than that, but they they expressed that. But I think all of those examples, the blues, jazz, punk rock, they all came up in societies where it was possible to say things like that. Like, you know, God Save the Queen, a fascist regime, you know, anarchy in the UK and all that kind of stuff. It was possible, although the Sex Pistols got banned more times, they, they had more bans than they did releases, you know, they were banned everywhere. Yeah. Um, so you could that make you could make that point, you know, the, the the opposite. But they still that album still sells. You know, it's, the, it's not the big controversial thing that it was at the time, where it, you know certain record shops wouldn't carry it and all that kind of stuff, and newspapers wouldn't carry the adverts. Yet it still sold. Yeah. So I guess there's a kind of a there's a kind of a tension there between what it's possible to say in any particular regime, and there are certain things probably in every political. Um, political environment that it doesn't, it doesn't matter how free it is you still couldn't say it you, you still would get into trouble if you said it yeah you know whether that would be from the 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 leaders of the political regime itself or whether it would be from your public you know who anybody who was listening if you there are certain words i wouldn't even say them <laughs> just now you couldn't say them yeah. uh there's quite there's a, there's a number of them there's a few words that you can't say but um you know i guess if you that that's one of the reasons that comedy is is such a such a great companion to music because comedians can say stuff that mu- musicians typically would struggle would struggle to say. You know, even the most radical musician would struggle to use some of the language that a, that a comedian can use because that's their kind of their job. It's why they're there. You know, and I, thought, I always think that's a it's a kind of a barometer of a of a a society what can be said and what can't be said. 